thank you again for organizing this. Thank you. <laughs> You're so welcome. Thank you both for being here. Um, all right, so we're going to go live and it'll be kind of silent for a couple seconds while I wait for people to come on and then I'll begin my intro. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Katie from Greenlight, and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Elon Stevans presenting his new book, Popple Vu, a retelling. He will be talking with Boris Draljuk, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I want to say a huge thanks to Elon, Boris, and the team at Restless Books for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. So we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Before we get started, there's just a few housekeeping things to go over. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here, though, and you can see a count of fellow attendees at the top of your Zoom screen. The exact location will depend on what kind of device you're using. Uh, you're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and to interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two little speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program, so please make sure you're putting them there and not in the chat. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our social media channels later on. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Popple Vu, a retelling, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. The book is officially available on November 10th, and you can order online now at greenlightbookstore.com for pickup in the store or for shipping anywhere in the US. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer tonight is Boris Straljuk. He is a literary translator and the executive editor of the Los Angeles Review of Books. He is co-editor with Robert Chandler and Irina Mashinsky of the Penguin Book of Russian Poetry, editor of 1917 Stories and Poems from the Russian Revolution and 10 Poems from Russia, and translator of Isaac Babel, Mikhail Zoschenko, and other authors. His reviews, translations, and poems have appeared in the Times Literary Supplement, The New Yorker, The London Review of Books, The Guardian, Granta, Harvard Review, The Yale Review, The New Criterion, Jewish Quarterly, and other publications. We will be speaking tonight with our featured author, Elon Stevans. He is the Lewis Sieber Sebring Professor of Humanities, Latin America and Latino Culture, and the publisher of Restless Books. He has translated Lazario de Tormes, Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz, Jorge Luis, Luis Borges, Pablo Neruda, Mariano Azuela, and Juan Brufo into English, Emily Dickinson and Elizabeth Bishop into Spanish, Yehuda Halevi and Yehuda Amitai from Hebrew, Isaac Bashevis Singer from Yiddish, and Shakespeare, Cervantes, and The Little Prince into Spanglish. His books include On Borrowed Words, Dictionary Days, Quixote, On Self-Translation, and The Wall. He edited the Oxford Book of Jewish Stories, The Norton Anthology of Latino Literature, and Becoming Americans, Four Centuries of Immigrant Writing. The recipient of numerous awards and honors, his work, rendered into 20 languages, has been adapted into film, TV, radio, and theater. His new book, Popol Voom, a retelling, is an inspired and urgent prose retelling of the Maya myth of creation. Cosmic in scope and yet intimately human, the Popol Vu uh, offers invaluable insight into the Maya way of life before being decimated into by colonization, their code of ethics, their views on death and the afterlife, and their devotion to passion, courage, and the natural world. Elon and Boris are going to be having this conversation, and then they'll be talking with all of you. Please take it away, Elon. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Katie, for that lovely introduction, um, very replete. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you to the staff of Greenlight. Um, and thank you, Ilan, for this wonderful artifact um, that I've had a chance to live with for the past month and a half. Um, and the, my first question um, is meant to introduce the, the book itself, but also to broach a subject that I hope will come up time and again throughout our discussion, which is the subject of translation and storytelling. So the first thing I'd like to ask is, um, it's a, an interesting genre, a retelling. Why did you decide to bring this book to uh, an English-speaking audience by way of a retelling? It's not a translation, it's, it's a retelling. So tell us a little bit about that choice. I want to start by, by thanking the folks of, the, of Greenlight Bookstore, uh, particularly in this time of the pandemic calamities. Uh, I was we were just talking to Katie and the fact that uh, independent bookstores exist and that they are doing a crucial uh, job, and I think, from my perspective, 
it's an essential job for democracy to be able to uh, showcase ideas uh, and allow authors uh, to debate them in public. Um, I'm very grateful and hopeful that, uh, that this job will, will continue. And I am thrilled, Boris, to be in conversation with you. You and I have been in a epistolary dialogue for many, many years. Uh, you, you have been a figment of my imagination. I admire the translations that you have done of Isaac Babel, uh, the, the Penguin book that you put together. And uh, I look forward to the, to the dialogue that we're about to have. A translation for me, Boris, probably like you, um, is a way to refresh ourselves as we connect with the past. Uh, without translation, we would not exist. Everything surrounding us, even for uh, those of us who are uh, exclusively monolingual, translation is a feature of modern times. It infringes on us uh, through television and the radio, through products, um, in the way we think of the world concepts, uh, the vocabulary we use. Um, I have a I have been very aware of translations since I was a, a, a very young. I grew up in a multilingual environment and uh, I really wasn't uh, conscious of uh, the, back, the backs and forths that were taking place because in the mind of a child that is, uh, that is automatic. You, you speak Yiddish with a particular uh, group of people and then you just cross the door and are speaking Spanish and then you cross the door and you're speaking Hebrew or you're speaking English. Um, and in your mind, you compartmentalize, you know uh, where to use certain words. And only when you grow older do you realize what you have actually been doing, or at least I did it in that way. And, and when I did, Boris, I began to acti actively seek um, a, a projects in order to translate, because I wanted to see them redress, re refashioned, uh, how would Borges sound in English? How would Elizabeth Bishop sound in Spanish? How challenged would it be to do all that? And uh, there is uh, a, a loyal and truthful and authentic and bona fide type of translation. And probably the extreme of it is the, is the Google Translate that does it uh, mathematically or by a logarithm. Uh, but then there's the human and the humane translation that also wants to be loyal and truthful. Um, and, uh, and I have embarked on those ones and I have been um, happy to try to see how both the content and the music of a particular text can exist or be recreated in another language. But when facing the Popol Vuh, which is a very complex labyrinthine, a, a multi-layered document from the past that in and of itself contains challenges to translation, but also is shaped as a result of translation because of the journey that the oral tradition in, in had in putting it down in the form of a codex that others would be able to read, then the Spaniards that came and re-rendered it into uh, the language of the colonizers, and then the resistance of the Quiche and, and the, the Mayan people in general to retain the flavor of the original. I felt that translation was ingrained in the text, but that the text had moved in a bunch of different directions and was um, was more than simply literary. It was historical, it was genealogical, it was uh, mythical, uh, it had more eloquent sections, less, less polished sections. And, uh, and it was at a time, Boris, and I conclude my, my, my long-winded answer uh, with this, that I was voraciously reading um, retellings of old myths. Uh, by Neil Gaiman, for instance, or by Arshia Sattar of the Ramayana, uh, Gaiman of the uh, Nordic or the Icelandic uh, uh, sagas. And the concept of a retelling uh, kind of planted itself in my mind. It is both an effort at translation and also an effort at making the text available 
for a new audience in a new form. I'm a scholar, I wanna be truthful in, in, in relate to the origins, but I'm also mindful that the Popol Vuh has been misread in a variety of ways. It can be trying, uh, full of obstacles for certain readers. I wanted to produce a piece that was able to speak to readers today uh, using the beautiful parts as the main core and redressing it in the form of a more modernized version. And I thought that the retelling would do uh, a, a, better, a better job than a straightforward scholarly translation. Absolutely, I, I, think, I think that was a wise choice. And my follow-up question has to do with, with just what you, you've just said, which is you wanted it to speak to us immediately, which means I suppose to speak to our current moment. And uh, I think it does in a number of interesting ways. Uh, um, the uh, foreword, uh, the introduction is written by Omero Adigis. And of course, uh, those who know his work know how his commitment to environmental causes in Mexico. And I think that's one of the ways in which this text speaks to us so directly in our moment. Could you maybe uh, tell us a little bit about the themes that as you were working on this retelling that struck you as being especially contemporary? This is a stunning document. It, is, it pains me that it's not better known in, in the entire world. And the energy, the traction, the grit behind this particular effort is precisely that, to enable it to be accessed by people today that are hungry to understand the cosmogony, the mythology, the, the, the life of the mind, the life of, the, of nature as conceived by the Mayan people, particular the, particularly the Quiche, uh, and, uh, and many of their themes and motif, motifs will be brought to us and, and inspired us. Um, this is a text that is about the origins of the world and the origins of the Quiche people. It is a book of origins and it is a book of community. How is it that we were born? Who were the gods that existed before uh, we arrived? What is the relationship between animals and, and flora? Um, what was created before? What, uh, what uh, position do we humans have in the scale of creation? Of the, of the gods, how many gods are there? What kind of relationship is there between those different gods? Is there only one world or, or are there many? And if there are many, what is the relationship between the various worlds that exist? Often we think of, for instance, or is the hell as being, or purgatory, as being creations that come from the, the at least two, of the Abrahamic religions, Judaism and, uh, and Christianity. And thanks to Dante, for instance, we have a very detailed architectural description of what that hell and that purgatory is in the journey or journeys that the souls make through the various chambers or circles uh, as the soul travels in its ascendance, uh, the connection with love. The, the, I think one of the, the great surprises that readers will find in this book is the vision of hell that the Quiche people had. The Quiche people are a people that uh, date back centuries. The, the, the first instances of, of the writing in the Americas go back to, this, uh, to the year 200 or 100 before the common era. Uh, this particular vision of creation, it likely went in the form of oral tradition, word of mouth from generation to generation up until more or less the year 1550, when after the arrival of the Spaniards, there was an effort to educate the indigenous population and make them be able to transcribe their own languages, in part so that the Spaniards would be able to read it and, and have access to it. And what they discovered 
uh, and what the, the Kiche and the Mayans had was a world where the ecology it mattered enormously. In this book, there is a, 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 an astonishing bestiary of creatures, some of which we know, uh, monkeys and, and, and parrots and snakes and scorpions, but others that we don't know, this is like fantastic creatures that might have the head of one animal and the tail of another one, that, have, might, that might have a special superpowers. There is the conception that, for instance, the, the skies, the heaven, are sustained by trees, saber trees. And if those saber trees at any point were to be destroyed, the whole universe, the whole cosmos would collapse. So this is a very um, a nature ecocentric book um, that I think speaks tons to a moment in our own history as humans where have become, where in which we have become more and more alienated from our surroundings, where we see nature simply as, as entertainment or as, as, a, as a tool to achieve whatever we are seeking. It, this book it calls for uh, a return to the appreciation of the environment, a return to a dialogue genuinely with the different creatures that populate it, and a humility, that is one of the parts that I love the most, a humility in regards to the position of humans in the cosmos. According to the Popol Vuh, we were not the first to be created when the gods decided that humans should come around. They tried before with the wood people, they were disappointed by them, they then brought us humans, but they were not more satisfied with us. And one of the differences between, say, the biblical narrative and the Popol Vuh is that whereas Adam and Eve are at the very center of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and thus um, the, anthropo the anthropocentric view really guides that, that vision of the world, here humans are kind of a, an afterthought uh, they are already uh, being looked at by the gods as dangerous, and uh, they are, they have first disappointed, and only later do they have to prove themselves uh, what their true value is. Absolutely. And, and now that we've addressed a, a bit of the earthly realm of uh, the Popol Vuh, let's, let's go back to that inverted realm of yeah. Shibal Vuh. Perhaps you can read us a little bit of, a, of an excerpt describing, uh, describing this, this other realm. Um, uh, I'm thinking specifically of, of page 46. Um, 46. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me just introduce this to, to our wonderful uh, audience. Um, is this the 46? Do you want me to start in 46? Oh, no, no. Please start, start with the, 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 the very beginning, with one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, I, would, I, would, I want to tell everybody that uh, Shibalba is the name of this uh, underworld that exists uh, tangibly somewhere in present-day Guatemala, uh, maybe the maybe Belize and uh, some regions of Chiapas. It is said to have actual caves through which you can enter that world. Uh, the underworld is thus under. It is dark, it is menacing, and it is inhabited by the nemesis of the actual gods uh, that created the universe. These are the lords of Shibalba, who are uh, in constant tension with the higher lords. Uh, I love the architecture of Shibalba. I love the whole imagery. And in my retelling, because I have been a uh, uh, a devoted reader of magical realism for many years, Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Julio Cortazar and Borges and Juan Rulfo. There are some elements of that, uh, of that mixture of dream and, uh, and the ethereal, the, the unexpected that is present here. This, is, this, is, uh, this comes from page 46. 
Um, Shibawa is the site of fear, a magisterial city with palaces in a torture dome, gardens in an oracle window where time got, comes to a standstill. Those unfortunate eyes who have been fated to see it describe the oracular window as irradiating unbearable darkness. The underworld is made of countless roads leading everywhere and nowhere. The entrance is a cave in Coban, Guatemala, although there are other cave systems in nearby Belize and Chiapas. The map of Xibalba is ciphered in the Milky Way. Nobody enters Xibalba, for there are innumerable obstacles and traps, including a river of scorpions. There is also a crossroads where visitors must choose among four paths, all of which lead to a parallel world where up is down, light is darkness, cold is warm, and good is evil. There are effigies near them, awaiting those who have not yet lost their minds. A special chamber is reserved for the white bearded men. Among the wonders of Shivava is its eternal mutability. Every time a traveler describes it, the place changes. To some, it is reminiscent of those of their own cities of origin. To others, it's like no place in the natural world. That's brilliant. Um, and of course, it does bring to mind, as you say, the, the, the imaginative realms of Borges, but also Dante, also Coleridge uh, with, with the vision of Xanadu. Um, tell me, uh, what else did you draw on as you were as you were working on this retelling? Where did you look for inspiration? You, you, Gaiman gave, kind of led the way, but what other texts uh, did you draw on? Other cosmogenies, perhaps? I was particularly drawn a a Boris to uh, a bizarre painter in Argentina a, that went by the name of Shul Solar. He was a close friend of Borges. He was a kind of mix between surrealism and a, maybe a absurdism. A, in many ways, you could see Dali in him, you could see elements of Picasso, but you could also see him pointing in the direction of a mythology that predates the arrival of the Europeans. When thinking about Shibalba, I first reread the works of uh, Guatemalan writers. Uh, I tried to reacquaint myself, Miguel Angel Asturias in particular, a Nobel Prize winner uh, about whom very little is known these days. He was, uh, he was a, a, a Baroque difficult writer, very interested in the mythology of Guatemala, very interested in, in the role of corn, maize, in the creation of Mesoamerica. I reread Legends of Guatemala, which tells in part some of the stories of the Popol Vuh. And I reread also some of the chronicles of the a conquest and exploration in the recycling of certain myths that the Spaniards had taken uh, from the Quiche, the Aztecs, the Nahuatl, uh, the uh, other indigenous population. Um, I am in this, in this part also, very interested as a scholar, Boris, in the connection between the biblical narrative and the Popol Vuh narrative. I grew up a Jew in Mexico, and though not linked to religion per se, the stories of the Bible populated my childhood. And when I first read as an adolescent the Popol Vuh, I was struck by the scaffolding that what one could find of the, of, of the biblical stories, stories about uh, deluges and earthquakes and uh, pandemics, uh, stories about uh, darkness and light. And uh, to this day, uh, even after doing this retelling, I am uh, very curious, uh, with, incapable of solving my own questions, of the influence 
that the Spaniards had in helping <coughs> the Mayan people tell their own stories in, in so doing, infiltrating those stories in different ways. How much of this is really the Popol Vuh story that, was, that went from generation to generation uh, orally and how much was it uh, appropriated, recycled by the Spaniards who uh, had an input with the translators, uh, with the transcribing, with the posterity side of the text? Yes, it's it, it's very much a a melange, and uh, the, I think that comes comes across very beautifully in this retelling. So tell me then, what role does the book, what role does this text play in the societies and from which it originated? So now that this macaronic culture of the of the sixteenth and seventeenth century has developed into all kinds of other cultures, tell us what what is the afterlife of the Popol Vuh, its continued life. I, 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 I love the question because a, a book doesn't only have a life, it has an afterlife. A book doesn't only matter for what it says, but it matters for what it means. And in this particular case, the meaning of the book is, is very significant. It was a, a book that at one point in 1550 was transca transcribed both to the Quiche language and also for the very first time into Spanish. And then it, uh, it lay dormant, at least we don't know much more about that, that particular copy, until in the, in the years, it is, it's, the dates are a bit elusive, or is a, around 1702 or 1703, a, a Dominican friar, a Father Francisco Jimenez, who a, settled in Chichicastenango, Guatemala, next to a lake, a, appear to have either found, stumbled upon, or somebody mentioned the, this document that existed. And uh, he turned it, he retranslated it and turned it into prose in Spanish. This edition uh, reproduces the first two pages of Francisco Jimenez's uh, version. Uh, that version was uh, exiled from Guatemala and ended up at the Newberry Library in the United States. And uh, those are both the perils and the triumphs of, uh, of the conquest. Had it, not uh, had it not depart from Guatemala, maybe it would have survived in some way. Uh, the fact that it arrived to the Newberry Library allowed it to be seen by scholars from different parts of the world there was a translation into German, several translations also into French, into English. We have had a various translations and more, re more, more recently, they have accelerated in frequency. I would say, and uh, you know this well, that uh, classics are books that survive translation, that, that uh, keep being retranslated all the time and uh, push us to think about them in, in different ways. There are many translations of Don Quixote, many translations of Madame Bovary or, uh, or Crime and Punishment. Uh, so the fact that the Popol Vuh has entered that lineage the, of, of different translators coming to it from different perspectives is very important. Uh, I have traveled through the southern part of Mexico. I have traveled to Guatemala. Uh, I have heard the importance that the book has uh, among the Quiche people. Uh, many of them know the book by knowing the legends that, that it tells. They connect with different characters of the book. They connect with the vision of, the, of nature and ecology that exists. And for a significant part of that population, this book is sustenance and it's also resistance. It's a way to say, we are not surrendering to the Spanish language and to the Spanish a way of life that has come from outside. And we have our own vision of the world. And that vision of the world, even though it is at peril and we have to struggle to make it uh, continue, we do everything we can from grandparents to grandchildren to pass on those values. Uh, I have found in Texas, in California, in about three weeks, I'm having a conversation with one of them 
uh, undocumented immigrants that have come from Guatemala who, uh, who, are, who work on the field, who are seamstresses, um, who, are, uh, uh, who, have, who have embodied the Popol Vuh with them. And uh, I look forward to having public conversations about the, the organic role that the book has in their, in their uh, communities and in their personal life. Last thing that I would say, um, uh, Boris, is that in my own definition of a classic, uh, I would say that it's a book that is capable of creating a nation. It, nations are built around narratives. Without narratives, nations don't exist. The narratives are the memories and are also the explanations of how those nations came together. And this is the story of the rise and resistance, uh, endurance of a nation. And it's an admirable story simply because, regardless of content, simply because you and I are talking about it right now. In other words, it exists, it endures. It, it, it might mutate, but, uh, but it lasts. And, and that is a form of triumph. I couldn't agree more, and that's very beautifully put. I, I love the fact that the overture to the book begins with sunset. But of course, it's always sunset in the life of a people, and it is what we do after sunset that, uh, um, that matters. So you're, very, you're, you're, you're quite right. I, I think the energy, the creational energy of this book is, is uh, something that really does inspire. Well, something else that inspires is, is the visual component. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about how the book is presented? Because it really is a, a, a gorgeous work. The book in this particular case is a, is a collaboration with a superbly talented a Salvadoran artist, a Gabriela Larios, who a, I have been in touch with for a long time. A, she created specially made uh, images that uh, are about this particular one, uh, uh, about Chibalba, the different chambers, uh, the house of uh, colds, the house of heat, uh, the tiger. And as you will see here, I will, I will talk about them momentarily, the, the famous hero twins that, that lead the story. Um, I, am, I feel honored and privileged to have worked with, with her. She has it really created a, a beautiful um, parallel retelling in visual terms. This is not a graphic novel, but the images are so stunning, I think, so, so in, in wrapping that they enable the reader, at least this reader, to grasp more concretely some of the, some of the, um, you know, the, 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 the parade of elements that show up in the book. Um, it was beautiful because I, I started translating, then I chose to retell rather than translate. And then I began a conversation with her, with Gabriela, and the images started to arrive as I was doing the work of translation. And it was a kind of cross fertilization between the two. She would ask me more about a particular character. I would, I would write to her, I would show her a particular section. Um, and uh, you know, it is as we know from from the hieroglyphics, from the iconography, from the paintings that exist in folk art. The Mesoamerican culture, you can see, kind of exported by way of Frida Kahlo, is a very colorful, contrasting, uh, fiesta-driven universe of of uh, reds and yellows and blues and greens, uh, full of flowers, full of animals, uh, very dramatic, that uh, populates this, uh, this, this wonderful Mayan culture. And she has been able to bring all those images into the book in, in, a, in a, here's one more, in a, in a stunning way. And only the images, I think, would, would make the book quite valuable. Well, thank you for that, for that excellent answer. Um, this is actually a, a very good time for the other participants uh, in this discussion to leave your questions in the Q&A section. Um, we'll talk for about five more minutes and then I'll begin to pose questions from the Q&A section. So do populate those fields now. 
Um, and speaking of population, maybe you can tell us a little bit about these these twins. Uh, tell us about um, uh, Hunapu and okay. <laughs> I, I, the 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 architecture of the Popol Vuh is made of opposites. Uh, Boris, there is the world and the underworld. There are the lords in heaven and the lords of the underworld in Shibalba. And uh, there are a number of twins um, that uh, appear at various points. The, there are this, they are called hero twins. Um, and they, they are famous not only for their heroism, but they are also famous for their ball playing. This is, this is something that I, I, I love to, to, uh, to reflect on. Uh, this is an origin story where sports plays a very important part. When the second set of hero twins arrives to the underworld, um, they are uh, challenged by the Lords of Shibaba to uh, ball game, to see how good they really are, the, the story of their, of their uh, legendary athletics has reached the Lords. And we see on a number of occasions, different kind of broadcasting sections where they are hitting the ball here, the, the Lords are reacting, they need a special envoy to help them. And um, the role that ball games played in Mayan culture and in Kiche culture at the time of the conquest and even before, but still to this day are, are very important. It's not quite soccer the way uh, we know it today. The, there were um, stone-made circles that were integrated into walls and people played not with the foot, but with their knees trying to bring the balls that were made of rubber into this, uh, the circles on the walls. And there were teams, the games could last an entire day, sometimes an entire week. Um, and in the book, the, the heroics of the twins really have much to do with their dexterity as athletes. It is both uh, dramatic and I think hilarious when they are facing the team of the underworld and they are able to conquer it. There are elements of magical realism because at one point they know the twins that they are going to, that they are, there's, there's a strategy to defeat them. They use a, a calabaza, a, a kind of big pumpkin to create a false head for one of them. It seems that one of their heads is decapitated. Uh, the Lords of Shibaba think that they have won only to realize that the head comes back. So you, get, you, you have to send sometimes as in a hundred years of solitude that a character dies and then comes back to life. It's, it's um, at the very end of the book in this retelling, there is a young set of uh, female twins that is now receiving the whole story from Father um, Jimenez and is passing it on to their own children. Uh, I love the capacity of the narrator, one author or many, to create this series of dualities as if a kind of an alter ego, uh, maybe Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but not so clearly differentiated in order to face the challenges of the Lords. The book, very, very, very briefly, the book has a cast of hundreds, if not thousands, uh, animals, ants, and, and birds, in, in the uh, tigers that speak, that, that react, that help the twins in different. There is a beautiful section about a grandmother uh, that accepts her future daughter-in-law into the family uh, there is the role of the kings, the capacity to defend the people, the trade it, betraying uh, prophets and, uh, and antagonists. It's, a, it's, a, it's an epic book full of wonderful characters. And uh, I'm looking forward to these various narratives spraying their wings into new generation of readers far beyond Mesoamerica. 
Absolutely. Well, th this is a, an excellent time to, to open it up to the audience so that we can all spread our wings. One question um, by Janice Garcia is, please mention the name of the Argentine visual artist uh, again uh, that, that inspired you. Um, his name is Shul Solar, X-U-L-S-O-L-A-R. Uh, this is a pseudonym that he, that he used. Um, he was a, an extraordinary a artist. He was an immigrant to Buenos Aires in part of the group of Borges in the magazine Sur, eh, around which Borges and others rotated. Excellent. Thank you very much. And our next question is from uh, Wendy, who is enjoying the discussion. That seems to be, everyone seems to be enjoying it. I'm glad to report. Uh, and the question is, what are Elan's favorite translations of Popol Vuh into any language and why? There are various translations of Popol Vuh into English. Um, I list them in a, a, a section that appears at the end of the book that is called Retelling the Tale. Um, in order to make my own translation, to shape my own translation, I went to many of them. Um, uh, there are some that are um, poetic, uh, in, in, pro, in poetry form, others that are scholarly, uh, by which I mean that the uh, academic apparatus uh, takes over in the form of footnotes, in the form of introductions and of parallel commentary. Um, I would not, you know, I, th there, there's, there are a couple of translations into Spanish that uh, I, I found very accessible in, and I also read one of the French translations. Um, I want to pay tribute to all the translators that have come before me. There are no new translations of classics that are that come uh, into the world without uh, without uh, somebody having built this structure uh, through a painstaking uh, effort and talent. And I think it's very important to look at previous translations uh, when you're doing a classic in order to understand the various strategies that uh, people have taken. I, I, I think that uh, in that sense, um, uh, Boris, the difference between translating a, a, a new contemporary text is that uh, you are there first in, on your own. When you translate a classic, you are part of a community that is atemporal, that uh, uh, relates to one another uh, through these books. And uh, at some point in the future, somebody will open my book as part of this dialogue and see where, what I did, and she will take a, a different uh, approach. Uh, but it is that dialogue that fills me with enormous energy and gratitude. Um, no translator exists in a vacuum. It, all translators are in dialogue when doing the classics. Here, here to that. Um, and the next question concerns textual history. Uh, Harry Kalpin would like uh, you to elaborate on, on this Spanish translation made by a Benedictine monk, monk that disappeared mysteriously. Yes. Um, this is a, a translation that, uh, you know, it, it's, it almost feels like an Umberto Eco novel, like uh, the name of of the rose, um, there are. Let me let me let me let me invoke here, uh, Josip Brodsky, who you know well, the Nobel Prize winner, the Russian American uh, poet, who uh, at one point went to Mexico, met, met Octavio Paz and others, and wrote what I think is one of his most beautiful poems about Mexico and about. The, the debt that Mexican culture owed to the Spaniards, uh, who at that time, when Brodsky went to Mexico, were already being vilified for the atrocities that they had committed. And we live today in the, in the second decade of the 21st century, very much under the uh, influence that uh, colonial, colonialism has been mostly a disruptive a movement, no doubt about it. However, uh, there have been within the, the current of, uh, of colonialism, 
uh, prophetic messianic redemptive figures who have fought against the very trend of destruction, oblivion, annihilation, uh, that I have tried to rescue documents. Uh, Father um, uh, Jimenez is one of them. We know very little about his uh, whereabouts. Uh, we know that he got his hands on this book, that he did something with this book that reverberated across time. And then he seems to have exited the way, I don't know, the ghost of Shakespeare, of Hamlet's father does uh, without leaving much uh, trace. Um, but it is thanks to him that the story has transitioned from the oral to the written form in a language that many of us have been able to access. So it might feel like disingenuous to thank a colonizer for allowing us the key to enter the Popol Vuh. But on the other hand, this man must have had a, a, an open mind and a genuinely tender heart who did not want to see the culture of the indigenous population vanish, but wanted to give it its own voice, kind of the, the forces that we have today a, against the kind of homo homogenization of culture. And um, I think that the, the, the quality of the writing of Father Jimenez is very much the quality of the Spanish of that, those times. Um, uh, uneven, uh, not always fully formed in terms of literary uh, style, uh, more concerned with um, recording the story than in telling the story in a way that could um, capture the reader's imagination. Uh, but it is a draft of that story and that draft has been crucial. It's kind of a palimpsest uh, that uh, is very important to us. And so I do, I pay tribute to him, to Father Jimenez. In fact, at the very end of my retelling, he makes a, a kind of cameo appearance um, in has a dialogue with uh, the, the twin daughters that I was mentioning, the, the female daughters, uh, in order to allow the story to go on, uh, the story of survival and endurance. And, and yes, and just to be clear, it, it's the manuscript on which Father Jimenez supposedly relied that has disappeared. Right. The, the Jimenez yes. text exists. Yes, yes, that is the one that the one of Jimenez is the one that is in the in the library. Yeah, in the library. very good. Now we have a, a question from Chen Yang. Um, in Bi in the Bible, God creates the world by thought. Let there be light. In Chinese tradition, the world is created by actions. In Popol Vuh, it is created by discussion of the discussion of the gods. Does this mean that language holds a special place in Kiche tradition? Terrific question, uh, and I am very appreciative. I don't know if I fully agree with you. I, I, uh, before I go to the question of the Popol Vuh, um, it, is the, it is in the Bible that God creates the world by stating uh, that different aspects of it should, should emerge. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. So the act of saying is, it antecedes the very creation of whatever aspect of the world, the heavens, the earth, the, the, in the seven days organized. You could even argue, as the Kabbalists have, that language needed to be created before the world was created for God to be able to enunciate what the next stages would be. In the Kabbalists, that is the mystical Jewish tradition, it, uh, understood that uh, the that language has a kind of primordial role to play. There is a beautiful story about the letter Aleph and the letter Bet, the very first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet, coming before God and saying, I want to be the first one. And uh, God asks them, why? Can you each of can you each make an argument and I will make my decision? And Aleph makes an argument and Bet makes an argument. And then eventually God decides in a Solomonic decision that uh, both of them are going to be first. One of them is going to be the first in the alphabet and the other one is going to be the first in the Bible because the Bible starts with the letter Bet, Breshit. In the Popol Vuh, the gods have a kind of 
council or discussion, uh, they, they, uh, they are in conversation and they decide to create the world as a result of that conversation. They are bored, they are dissatisfied with themselves, and they want to try out varieties of creations, mainly so that they can be adored, mainly so that they can be cherished. And when they create the, the wood people, they become quickly disappointed because the wood people are not able to pray to the gods. And so they erase them, and then they bring the humans in and try them out to see. You know, Leibniz also believed that there were alternative universes and alternative creations, and that maybe this world, the world that we inhabit, is not necessarily the best option or the most perfect one. It's one in the very in the very many alternatives that the that the god or the gods have created. What is important to notice here in response to the wonderful question by the by by the member of the audience is that uh, there's not only the, that the view of the world that the Kiche people have is polytheistic uh, that is there's not only one god although one central god seems to have more power than others there are a variety of gods that are in dialogue in conversation in that conversation itself um, it gives place to action I would say that if not really identical to the role of language that is played in the Bible, as I just described it, in, through the prism of, of, a, of a, the Kabbalah and the mystics, here you also have a sense, in, in my retelling, there is a sentence to that effect, that in order for the gods to be able to even begin the conversation, a language had to be created among them in order to relate to one another. And that language is, is, the, is the fiber, ultimately, that gives the world its, its structure. Thank you for that, Ilan. And the last question uh, takes us all the way back to the beginning, but your beginning. Uh, and it's, how do you believe your experience growing up in Mexico and the rich mythos um, of that culture influenced your retelling? And this is by Richard Courtney, the question. I appreciate that very much. I, I, also, I don't believe that there are objective translators, just as there no, there's really no objectivity in anything that we do when connected to language and art and uh, literature. Uh, my retelling is the retelling of uh, the grandchild of Eastern European Yiddish-speaking immigrants that uh, arrived to Mexico in the early years of the 20th, of the 20th century. Uh, my own retelling is filtered through the prism of having spoken a variety of languages. My own retelling is connected with the a deep and lasting admiration that I had when growing up in, in the Southern part of Mexico City in sharing a wonderful experiences with the, the native population that existed, sometimes in subal subaltern positions in the different parts of the city that I, that I the spaces of the city that I lived in. I, I very early on had this um, a hunger or thirst to understand more who, who the the indigenous population was, and how Mexico had turned the indigenous past into a kind of museum. Uh, they had, there was a museum for indigenous cultures, but every time you went there, and Juan Rulfo, uh, the author of uh, Pedro Paramo and the, 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 the Burning Bush, uh, was the director at some point of it, it was, overwhelmed by bureaucracy, corrupt, inefficient, with little budget. That speaks tons to the type of a relationship the Mexican government had to the indigenous population. Um, the, from the moment the, the Spaniards arrived, there, there didn't seem to be a place for the indigenous to be put in, because Mexico had this thirst had this drive to become modern, to become Europeanized, and anything that represented 
a, a, a compromised past and the indigenous population was a symbol of that past, needed to be buried, to put away, to store it, and to be turned into an artifact of a museum. Um, I, I reacted as a member of my generation in the 70s and 80s very strongly to this rejection, to this feeling of, of, a, of a bifurcated path for Mexico. Either you looked at Europe as your option or the United States, or you look at the indigenous past, but there wasn't a way to kind of truly bring them together. It was in the 80s where a, a, a movement to allow the indigenous voices to have a larger role in Mexico, that, 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 that movement took place. And in the early 90s, there was the Zapatista revolution in, the, in Chiapas, in the Yucatan, led by Subcomandante Marcos, who himself was from the city, but had hidden his identity and they tried to lead a rebellion in order to bring back the indigenous past into the present of Mexico. All that, I say all that because it is in, in the substratum of my mind. I think Mexico, I'm, I'm a child of immigrants, I'm white, I am a very grateful for what Mexico allowed me to do. And I owe it a, for a, a enormous gratitude. And my debt is in the form of bringing back an aspect of the country and of the region of Mesoamerica, which includes the upper part of Central America, that I feel was eclipsed when I was growing up. I'm hoping that uh, this English language version of the Popol Vuh will uh, call attention to the beauties and the complexities. Let's not infantilize in any way in the indigenous population. The, the contrast, the, 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 the struggles within the epic story that the Popol Vuh, that the Popol Vuh tells. Um, if we can convey in words that complexity, if we can give a, give a human face to those characters, I think we will be doing a, some correction to how the past was was shaped in Mexico. Well, in my opinion, Alan, it's a debt very handsomely paid. Um, thank you very much for this glorious discussion. It was really a pleasure to hear you reflect on a project that uh, I've been wondering about for a long time. Uh, I, I, many, many thanks to, for those wonderful questions and for doing what you do, bringing wonderful literature to the world. Thank you very much. And thank you all for your questions and thank you for joining us uh, for this discussion. Have a good night. Good night. Thanks so much, everyone. And thanks, Boris and Elon, for that wonderful discussion. Thanks to everybody for showing up. If you missed any of tonight's discussion or if you just want to watch it again, uh, we will be posting the recording to our YouTube, so please look out for it there. And don't forget to buy your copy of Popol Vuh out November 10th from greenlightbookstore.com. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye. Gracias.